How do you see email marketing in the age of social media? Email is still the test of time. It's something that's just kind of like a different level, right? It's like a little more intimate and personal and less about like everyone's watching. Back in the old days, if someone asked me how should I ideally start an online business, I used to say or everyone used to say build an email list first. At the end of the day, people just want entertainment. Even in B2B settings for like very serious business people, we're all still humans on the inside. We just want to be entertained yeah. and like read cool things that we're interested in. So you're running a marketing podcast yourself. What is that about? Troy? Yeah, so um, it's called the Secrets of Scale podcast. So I just bring on like high level people that have scaled, you know, beyond a million dollars or more. Typically now we've been attracting people who are like 10 million, not everybody, but um, it's it's really amazing and I have a chance to bring on some really special people and um, not just talk about business, but talk about like the real life stuff that entrepreneurs struggle with. And it, it's, it didn't really even start as that, like it started to be like, I thought it was gonna be something technical, um, mm -hmm. but it's been something that I've just really, really personally enjoyed. And now it's like, I do it just to, like help me and it also helps other people. Oh, that's very cool. So is your goal with that podcast to become a podcaster or is it an easy way for you to generate content uh, and have additional content or what's your aim? What are you aiming for here? Honestly, it's just to make connections and at the same time, like have content and it's, I'm not like a podcasting person by any means. I mean, I should be, um, but I just mm -hmm. post it on YouTube and on Buzzsprout and It, it's just really good content. And, you know, like I said, I enjoy it and um, other people enjoy it too. So it's even better. That's cool. Thank you. Who are your favorite and most interesting guests? Uh, Tanner Chittister so far. Um, he has a really amazing story. Um, he kind of like grew up and, and his parents were like super Christian and um, kind of told him there are certain things he shouldn't do and he couldn't do. And, um, he, he got really heavy into football, like I did in baseball and, mm -hmm. uh, became like a super, super hard worker, kind of hard on himself. Um, got to the point where he was just, you know, working 24 seven, started making millions of dollars a month. And then he started questioning what the point of life is. He even tried to take his own life once or thought about it like very deeply. Um, and since that moment, he's like matured like crazy. And, you know, I respect him a lot and look up to him. And, you know, he's a good friend down in Miami. So um, so that's been my favorite so far. But gosh, I mean, we've had, you know, Stefan George, I sold over a billion dollars of stuff in copywriting and copywriters alone have amazing stories. And, you know, we've had Chris Evans on there um, and we've had some lesser known people that are killing it too, like AJ Roberts um, from, you know, EverWebinar and um, Kartra mm -hmm. and, Just like really, really awesome people. And it's like, there's so many people out there. And anytime I get to connect with somebody cool, I'm like, hey, come on. And we're just going to chat. And mm -hmm. I love it. They love it. People listening love it. So mm -hmm. that's cool. Yeah. I also spoke with Stefan Georgi. Very interesting guy. Like, I, I like the way he, like, how he explains copywriting and how he got into that. It was very cool. Um, so, Do you have any favorite learnings, things that you learned from interviewing those people? Yeah, I would say, honestly, like Onyx Singal, um, when I interviewed him, he just kind of talked about like, this is actually crazy. I, I can't remember what year, but every day since like, oh, I think it was like over 10 years ago. So roughly 2012, um, he has made at least $300 per day every day since then. And that's when he was a mm -hmm. complete beginner. So like even people who make millions and millions of dollars a year, like sometimes you have days where you don't close anybody on the phone and you make a zero on occasion. Like if that's how your yeah. business is set. But like every single day he's made at least 300 bucks and it all started um, with him going in some old school forum and um, people were asking questions and he would just like drop value bombs in the group. And then mm -hmm. in his like account on the forum, he would have a link where people could go hire him for stuff. And it just kind of speaks that even though it was a while ago, you can still do the same thing today in like Facebook groups. So whether, you know, there were beginners listening, that was super valuable for them, or whether there's more advanced people listening, it just kind of shows you that the basics work. And like, even I still get a lot, a lot of people organically. So um, I think it was a really good reminder and Onik is a genius. So that was probably my favorite tactical tip.
Okay. Yeah, that's very cool. Thank you. Um, I would like to know how you got into email marketing and copywriting. These are the fields that fields of your expertise, right? Yeah, that's um, that's a pretty crazy story too. So when I was growing up, I just wanted to be a baseball player. Like that was it. And much like I was saying what Tanner did, like all I did every day was like baseball, baseball, baseball. That was it mm -hmm. with my dad. Um, so in high school, I actually tore my UCL, which is this like ligament right here. And mm. it's kind of hard to see the scar, but it's there. Um, which meant Tommy John surgery. And for anybody who, you know, watches baseball, that's normally something that professionals get when they're like 30 something years old. And it's a year long recovery because you literally just like tore this super important ligament. Um, hmm. And I had that at 16. Uh, and it, it's more common now in younger people, unfortunately, but it kind of wrecked my world and flipped it upside down. Now, you know, I came back, um, I wasn't able to pitch in high school for two years after that. So I pitched again my senior year, still made it to college. Um, in college, I had some mental issues that stemmed from the injury and I got cut as a senior in college. And that was like my identity. And, and mm. I felt like I had to hide after that. So when that happened, um, I kind of just started, like I, I always had a little bit of an interest in making money online because it was different than what every other person does after they graduate college. So I just kind of took that time when I was hiding and like went in a deeper dive. Um, started going on Upwork, started finding some clients, started making connections with people. Um, I actually came across one guy named Greg Berry. Nobody's ever heard of him, but he was running a company called Burger Box. Um, they were like, it was like the first unhealthy meal kit where they mail you burgers. And um, Gary Vee was a partner. There were NFL players that were partners um, pushing this thing. And then it, it collapsed and the investors pulled out. But Greg was like, hey, I, I know in this last business, you introduced us to funnels. You were doing some cool stuff. We had never heard of that before. So I want you to start a different business with me. I was like, okay. Um, so it was called Hustle Island. And it was like, as an entrepreneur, um, you're, you're always hustling, but sometimes it kind of feels like you're stranded on an island because nobody else can relate to you. So that's why he called it that. And it was mostly like apparel and like very basic education. Um, so he'd let me take that business and try so many different things in it, and which was awesome. And I, I feel more well-rounded because of that. But one day he was like, hey, have you ever run an email list? Like we have over 100,000 people on our list. I don't know what I'm doing. Do you have any idea what you're doing? And I was like, no. And he's like, all right, you got the job. So he put me in charge of email, um, started sending to the list, made a lot of mistakes, but um, you know, made some money at least. And then some of my other clients that I was running Facebook ads for, I only had like two or three clients at the time. Um, they were like, hey, we need to shut the ads off. And I was like, why? And they're like, well, it's not converting on the back end. So then I was like, huh, I have some experience in this email thing. What if I just go in and I try to get your, your back end, your emails to convert for you? And they're like, okay, might as well. Otherwise, you're fired. I was like, okay. So I went in. I had two different clients and I, I saved both of them just by like getting their emails out of spam making the copy mm -hmm. more appealing and literally just sending more emails. And funny enough, like what I do today is not that different than those three things. Um, okay. So I realized it was more of a blue ocean to go that way because at the time, at least at, you know, the beginner level that I was at, like everybody was a Facebook marketer. So I just switched mm -hmm. over to email. Um, I got connected to Stefan Georgi and Justin Goff and got in their mastermind, made some good connections with people in 2020, it kind of blew up just, you know, managing email lists for people. And that's, you know, still what I do today. Um, and we've expanded our offerings a bit. So not only do we, you know, do email list management, but we also just solve deliverability problems. We have a certification program now. Um, so it, it's been a really fun ride, but that's how I got started. Uh -huh. Do you also do consulting or is it just that you man you're managing those? Yeah, in a way, I mean, if it's the right person, we'll do consulting where it's, you know, straight up like, hey, let's jump on Zoom for an hour and talk about how you can improve. 
Um, but for the most part, the consulting is in the form of like, if somebody's in our certification program, our team is in there, you know, everybody on the team is like in house with me when I'm not traveling, of course. Um, and we help people in that way, or like our private clients will of course help them with other questions that they have that, you know, aren't already covered for any reason, but yeah, not, not too much one-on-one consulting. I did a little mm. bit for like Vshred recently, but that was about it. Uh, V-Shred is interesting. Um, the other fitness guys hate him, but he's super, super successful. Yeah, I saw Nick at um, 100 Million Mastermind the other day, and he's just mm-hmm. a, a wealth of knowledge. And, you know, everything I've helped them with email, he's helped me more and other things and just talking about business, giving me ideas. So um, they're they're pretty cool over there. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they're everywhere. I mean, V-Shred is so dominant. It's It's... But um, but yeah, I like like <laughs> I remember an ad where he teases. I think it's Vince. No? Vince is his name, right? Where he teases. Yep. Uh, yeah, yeah, like this is the one thing that makes your test levels uh, go up again. And then he, you keep listening, but he never tells you when. But maybe maybe later down the road. But like in the. I could never figure it out. Yeah, so that's very cool. How did you learn all this? I mean, you kind of it, it. It sounds so easy what you just described that oh, oh well, you just optimized the email and managed it. Um, but how how did you approach that? How did you get that knowledge to be able to do that? Yeah, it, I mean, it started off with experimentation, right? So, like, I'm very thankful for Greg and just having a client that allowed me to to try anything it was like nothing was off limits and at the time he was basically like hey here's my credit card like whatever you think might mm-hmm. work buy it like you want to try mm-hmm. you know media buying do that um you want to buy something for email do that so i mean i sat there and it was like hundred thousand something person list and i just got to create some automations i was like the first thing i was like all right well somebody opts in they should probably get some emails so i started writing mm-hmm. them trying give like a personal approach um so at the time it's like step one is easy like send something because they weren't really Mm -hmm. sending too much uh step two was just trying to like figure out like okay what makes the most sense like how can we move them up the ladder like they okay so they just bought something that's free plus shipping so like the very first product we ever sold it's this black hustle t-shirt and i have one in the other room But uh, I carry it with me most places because entrepreneurs love it. I've seen people wearing it on planes, the airport, wherever. But um, it said hustle, and it was made up of a bunch of smaller words like grit, Mm -hmm. persistence, hard work. Um, And we sold those. And and that offer, gosh, I think there's like 24,000 of those shirts out there. Um, So all these people had free plus shipping shirts, and they loved them. It was like, how can I take them up the ladder and just like sell them more things that they're going to love, whether it's apparel, whether it's coaching. Um, and we didn't really even have a super high ticket offer. So I just kind of played around, saw what worked, saw what didn't work. Um, mm-hmm. It was also the first time that I got like replies from people on the internet. And I realized that a lot of people are really mean. <laughs> but mm-hmm. um, on top of that too, just like paying attention to the like the open rates and um, eventually learned a little bit about the, the spam folder and, and the Gmail promo tab and all these areas where the emails can land. And, you know, I bought a lot of info products from different people. It kind of like got my head turning and then I thought of ways to make it even better. So just a lot of experimentation um, and, and buying different info products and being in Facebook groups with smart people and joining, um, you know, Copy Accelerator eventually. And, and just being around people who are always thinking, their brains are always turned on. There's mm. business going on at all times, and uh, yeah. So I would say that's how, but mainly just um, just getting my hands dirty. It's like mm. there's a lot of freelancers out there that they're a little bit timid to to try things, but for me, it was it was fun. So I think that's what helped the most. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, it sounds like you used a lot of common sense and. A lot of things I found in marketing are very commonsensical. So like, okay, if if you want to lead the customer to do something, you have to kind of pace them first. You have to pace them first and then uh, kind of uh, find a common ground first and then 
and it, it's it's very common sense you know it, it, a lot of it is, is quite common sense uh, this is what i liked about marketing and so i was a dentist before i started my company and most of the things i just also learned by doing and i used my common sense but for some people it's very easy and for other people it's kind of hard but um you're lucky that <laughs> You're born with that kind of common sense. That's awesome. Um, you yeah. mentioned that. Yeah. Oh, I was just going to say sometimes people, you know, they're just too close to the thing that they're working on. And it seems like yeah. common sense to other people. But to them, it's just, you know, like I, I've done that stuff before, too, like not on a really basic level. But, you know, I got some help at the mastermind this past weekend that was like, wow, I can't believe I was that dumb. And now it, mm -hmm. now I feel like very free mentally. So. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned that it, it sounded like you think email marketing is better than Facebook marketing. Can you elaborate on that a little bit, please? Yeah. So originally, I just meant that for me, right? So it was like, there's so many people saying like, hey, I'm a Facebook marketer. And I'd already tried my hand at that. And I was like, okay, like sometimes my clients got results, but if they didn't have a back end, it was harder. And sometimes I didn't get results. Um, so I figured if I just worked with people who already have a database of leads and I don't have to spend any of their money on ads, why not just monetize the leads they already have? And it just seemed a lot simpler and there's way less people doing it still to this day, mm. like three years later. Um, so That was really important to me. Um, but yeah, just in general, it's like, even when I talk to people who are making like tens of millions of dollars a year, some of them don't do a good job monetizing their backend leads. I was talking mm -hmm. to somebody the other day who probably going to hop on the phone with the next couple of days or one of the best network marketers in the world. And they were like, hey, like, I'm not doing as good as I can at monetizing the people who come in on my email list. Like, I need some help with that. And a lot of times there's just really low hanging fruit um, mm -hmm. that I would originally I was kind of shocked. I was like, wow, I can't believe they didn't do that. But when you look around, there's a lot of smart people who are very, very good at what they do. It's just their expertise is not email. So they just mm -hmm. want somebody else to come in, start monetizing those leads. And sometimes it's uh, it's pretty easy to get them results. Um, and then other times you work with somebody who like is very fine tuned with email and they just want help with something that's more specific, um, like deliverability or just like looking at something and tweaking it or, you know, changing their automations up. Um, so sometimes it's really simple. Sometimes it, uh, gets a little more complicated, but, um, yeah, I, I think there's more than enough, um, really awesome people out there with databases that, are largely untapped that a lot of people can mm -hmm. do really well in the email space. But I, I think they would, they would need some backend products, I guess, or, or otherwise do affiliate marketing. Do you, do you also work with affiliate marketing with like products of other people for those lists? Yeah. Yeah. So we don't do a ton of it, right? So like in the email list management world, it's interesting because You've got a lot of people like Mike Geary and Liz Graham and um, uh, Ryan and Cody Bramlett or Tyler, I mean, um, that work very exclusively with like health lists and um, they mm. push a lot of affiliate offers. And that's kind of like their list management like sector. Um, and then me and a lot of the people in my circle or that I've taught um, or just like colleagues, they'll just work with like, high ticket coaches, consultants who are mainly interested in selling their own offers. Um, that's where I fall more. So mm -hmm. we do push affiliate offers from time to time. We have a handful of people in the survival space um, and they love affiliate mm -hmm. offers over there. So we push pretty much just affiliate offers. But for the most part, it's, um, you know, high ticket coaches, consultants. Sometimes they built the list mm -hmm. from opt-ins or from low ticket and, There's nothing I love more than selling high ticket. I think it's just fun. And, you know, I do it for myself. I do it for clients and just, I just get the most joy out of it. And, and can that be sold directly through email or would you need like uh, people on the phone, a call center or a webinar before that, before doing that? You can. Um, typically we want people to have a phone team, but there are 
generally, especially if you haven't done a lot of mailing, there's a, a small handful of people who are like card in hand ready to buy today. Um, and you can actually sell them through reply emails. Um, so you kind of just give a description of like the problem that um, you solve and some specifics about the person. So if they're the right person, they've read it and they've resonated at the bottom. It just tells them to reply with a certain word or reply like ready or something. Um, then within two to three emails, you can close them. And, you know, we've done that before. Um, it works for us to a certain extent, but then, you know, it's only going to work for the people who really trust you. And then after that, you have to get them on the phone. But yeah, for the most part, um, it's just uh, Zoom calls that, you know, us and our clients close people over. But um, yeah, there's a lot of ways to do it. Um, it's just one of them. And I like to say everything works, but you just have to figure out what works most often for you. Mm -hmm. I see. How do you see email marketing in the age of social media? Yeah, um, it's interesting because on social media, at least with marketers, there's something that dies like every week, right? It's like mm -hmm. you're, you're scrolling through and somebody's like, oh, email is dead. And you're scrolling through and somebody else says yeah. Facebook ads are dead. And it, like there's a funeral every week for something. I don't know what it is. but um, And email has stood the test of time. I mean, it's been around yeah. for like, gosh. I mean, the very first email was sent like somebody told me it was in the 40s. But as mm -hmm. far as like common people using it, right, like in the 90s generally. And we still check it every day, all of us. And um, it's something that's just kind of like a different level, right? It's like a little more intimate and personal and less about like everyone's watching, which is great. Mm -hmm. Social media is awesome. It's done wonders for me. Um, but there's just something a little bit different and people are, are used to email and um, sure the open rates aren't as high, but if you fix your deliverability, you can have a really large list with 20 something percent open rates and the right people will pay attention because if you hook them in in the first email you send them, make a good first impression, they'll keep reading. And it's less about being transactional and just selling them stuff and making mm -hmm. them feel like most people make them feel right. Cause like a lot of times you get on a company's list, they'll keep bugging you about 10% off 15%, 20%, whatever. But where is the connection? Like, where's the story? So that's something that I try to do um, and just make people feel like, hey, this is a guy I can relate to. And this is somebody who seems kind of cool. Um, I'm in Sam Ovens mastermind. He said very wisely one time, you want to like, you, like your right market, they just want to come over. They just want to hang out. And when you give them that feeling like they can come hang out with you and you're somebody that's just fun to be around, and you can relate to them and connect to them emotionally, um, they're going to keep reading no matter what platform. So there's a lot of similarities and there's a lot of differences. I mean, you can put very similar messages on both, um, but email just seems a little bit more intimate because it's that one thing that people are reading and they know that nobody else is going to see what they're reading right now and nobody else is going to see the reply other than the person that they're replying to. Uh -huh. That's interesting. So you don't think that the attention, a lot of people say the attention spans have gone down and people are not um, supposedly attentive enough or be able to focus enough to still read longer emails. If you include stuff like, you know, trying to give them value storytelling and things like, like, like that. So you don't agree with this notion that this happened or Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a, a decrease in attention span. And I don't think that as many people are going to read things, right? Because there's just so much information flying at us every day. And it's not just like in social media, right? I think in general, like people in the world are a little bit less attentive yeah. um, when it comes to anything. But it's all about that first impression, right? Because the reason they joined the list is because you said something that resonated with them something triggered where they're like huh i want to know more about that so uh -huh. if you send them a really good first message and they read it and they like it they're going to open the next one because at the same time like attention spans are shorter but curiosity is like 
I don't know if it's at an all time high or if I just feel that way, but people are just very curious if you've got something good going on. So it's very mm-hmm. much about the first impression um, and just understanding that with email, it's a lot more about quality versus quantity because you can send a really short email and get a lot of clicks, but you didn't really have time to explain all the finer details and, and like call out the right person and, you know, do all the things that like a good sales letter would do just an email mm-hmm. form. So you'll get more clicks, but they'll be less invested. Whereas if you send a longer email, like I sent some long emails that got a good amount of clicks, like not as many as the super short ones. But I know when those people click that button after reading all that info, they're going to be way more invested and you know way more likely to buy or take whatever action um, after they've clicked. So it's just a trade-off quality versus quantity. And I'm always on the quality side. Like, Right now, personally, my list isn't that big compared to what most people probably think it is, but it does really well because we've got a tribe of people um, that have been following me for a while. And like our team now is kind of coming into the limelight a little bit. And we're just helping a lot of people, telling some cool stories. And um, and people appreciate that. Uh-huh. Thank you. That's That's pretty interesting. So, you know, like 10 years ago, maybe even more, 20, 13 years ago or so, I was working in the dating industry and I um, did also did some tr- translation work for email marketing. And we used to have like these super long emails. It was crazy. Like every email was like a medium sized ebook, let's say between 20 and 40,000 words. It, it took forever, like the way I perceived it. It was a lot of storytelling. It, it took forever to write those lengthy emails. And um, we made like hundreds of them. So it's it's really crazy. Would you still do that? So uh, would you recommend for email marketing to write like super long texts? Of course, with quality. Yeah. Um, gosh, I haven't tried something that long. And that's pretty long. Mm. <laughs> Like I've written sales letters before and, um, you know, typically that is the length 20 to 40,000 words. And yeah. I, I would say a situation where you could do that is if you're testing and you're like, gosh, I don't want to spend all this time to like make a landing page. I just want to see if this works. And you can mm-hmm. send it and then the link just goes straight to like an order form um, at the very bottom. Huh. But yeah, I would say landing pages are probably a little bit better for them to read that on because there's less buttons. Like if they're on their phone, you know, mm-hmm. there's like the back button and there's so like yeah. notifications that can pop up. Um, but if they go to a landing page, there's a little bit less distraction and they're more so used to it. Cause like, especially when people figure out like, like when they read the email, there shouldn't be a lot of elements of like, oh, I'm being sold to. But as soon as they click ah. the link, by that time, depending on how you write the email, they click the link and then they're kind of like excited, right? To go to the landing page because they're potentially going to buy something that's going to make their life better. They're kind of excited mm-hmm. about it. Um, and as they keep reading, 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 and then they get to the price and that's the point where they're really excited because they're in or they're like, gosh, like I really want this, but money. Um, so... I just feel like landing pages are a little bit different element where it kind of like, that's the place where people shift over from being unaware that there's something for sale or less aware, at least um, to more Mm -hmm. aware. And they're kind of like excited and they have that little, little butterfly. And sometimes I still get that with like info marketing products and Mm -hmm. really excited to learn something new. So do you, do you also, like, do you also sub- subscribe personally to email lists? Can you recommend email lists that you really like where you get a lot of value? Yeah. So in the marketing space, um, Stefan George, I, Justin Goff, uh-huh. love their emails. Um, there's a lot of interesting ones too. It just kind of depends what, what niche you're in. But as far as like marketers, mm-hmm. those are some of my favorites. Um, as far as other people who put out like good info products, like Rudy Maurer a lot. Um, mm. you know, he piques my curiosity. So those are a few right there. Um, to be honest, I'm not on as many lists as I used to mm. be. Just uh, because I get it, it's really good to learn, 
at some point when you figure out exactly what you want to do and there's no more questions about it, you just want to focus on you. But um, in the email space too, like Daniel Throssell, he tells some wildly entertaining stories. Um, Brennan Hopkins is kind of funny. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, you know, there's a few people out there in, in my space, but um, yeah, there, there's a lot of good people in every niche and it's more just about hopping on and seeing if they get that first message right or, you know, within the mm-hmm. first few and seeing if it's entertaining, if it's fun, if it's something that you want to stay a part of. Mm-hmm. Cool. Thank you. Um, in, in, back in the old days, if, if, like, if someone asked me how should I ideally start an online business, it, I used to say, or everyone used to say, yeah, build an email list first. Would you still agree with that or would you do anything el else? differently yeah it really depends on what you're selling right so there's certain niches um especially like high ticket b2b that's what my funnels mm -hmm. are um now starting a business is a little bit different but i know when i put out like a high ticket b2b funnel where somebody clicks that landing page book a call i know i can make sales from that right away and then mm -hmm. i've also been in niches like fitness where i've tried that exact formula And like nobody books a call um, because they want to yeah. get to know you first. Uh, so there's a, a lot of different factors involved. Um, but one thing that I found too is that even though I can sell straight up like high ticket B2B, um, I still like to collect their email address first. Now, I might get a few less opt-ins just because mm. there's a little more distance, but those people are going to be more serious. And my strength is email. So I want to make sure that I can start sending them one or two messages every day. Um, and they keep reading and eventually they're going to be like, wow, I like this guy. Um, and they join a program and, you know, uh, either it changes their life if they're a freelancer or we make them a bunch of extra money in their business if they're a business owner. Um, so yeah, it's really important to build one somehow. I think when I first started, I just pestered some friends that I made on Facebook and I had like 34 people on my email list. Seven of them were mm -hmm. me and like 10 of them were my family. So that leaves us with like 17 strangers that felt guilted enough to say yes and join my list. And some of them are still on it to this day. So um, I would say that somebody starting out really just like going... Like, I, I just love Facebook. I don't know if it's the marketing community or what, but like there's so many amazing groups out there of people that you mm. can connect with. Um, makes it really easy to get started. And then once you kind of have your community, your network, um, you can be like, hey, I'm starting a list. This is exactly what I'm going to talk about. It's going to be, you know, very personal mm. to the point. Uh, like I might sell things on occasion, but right now I'm just going to be mm. transparent and, and vulnerable and tell stories. Um, you can start building it that way. Um, especially if it's like a personal brand. Um, but yeah, it, there's certain products. If you're making a funnel that work really well with an opt-in up front, um, certain ones that work well, asking people to book a call, it, it really depends on the niche, but that's my experience with like B2B. That's very cool. It, it really sounds to me, it sounds like if someone would start an a social media channel. Uh, yeah, I'm going to be very personal uh, and share my story, be vulnerable, etc., etc. Is it really kind of like the same thing? Just a It's different similar, medium? Or? I feel like you can get a little more personal with email. So for example, my COO, Dom, we're trying this thing where he's like also starting his own list. So it's almost like a co-registration, but Like mm. we didn't have it set up that way. So they have to opt in for his separately, but it's really interesting because he's a, he's a crazy guy with a lot of really interesting stories that people love if they're the right person, but he doesn't necessarily want to share those on social media. He just wants to like send mm. emails and see how people receive them. And he can very literally be way more vulnerable in email than he can on Facebook just because the nature of the platform. Mm -hmm. Um, and don't get me wrong. There's a lot of people who say like vulnerability nowadays, and they're not really vulnerable at all. 
Um, mm-hmm. So you have to make sure that you fulfill your promise if you tell people that you're going to tell vulnerable stories that are kind of crazy, kind of weird, kind of funny, kind of goofy. So. Uh-huh. So would you allocate a lot of time into writing long emails? Would that be like the majority of your use of your time if you start a business or run a business? Yeah. So if you're starting a business, um, the the first things that I do, like if I'm setting up email for a business is A, see like what's going on with the offer, right? So like, mm-hmm. where are they selling up front? Or like, how are the people joining the list? And then what is the goal that you want to get them to eventually? Is it like a mastermind? Is it a high ticket program? Like, what is it? And then you think about like, okay, how can I bridge that gap? Um, and the easiest way, like number one, is just get sending, right? So like you have your end goal in mind and you have where they are now. Now you just need to send something to try and get them up the ladder. Um, The second thing is just taking a look at like deliverability, right? So like just make sure that people are going to see the message, first of all. And there's a lot of advanced things down the rabbit hole there. Um, third thing is just setting up some automation. So like when people take certain actions, there's probably certain messages that they should receive. So I just want to think through it and make sure from their shoes that they're getting what they expect And we're kind mm-hmm. of also like surprising them with something unique. Like I was saying, we're mm-hmm. not going to send them coupons and discounts like everybody else does. We're going to send them something that's kind of fun. Um, so those are some of the things that I would set up first. Um, some of the emails earlier on can be a little more to the point. Like if they opted in for something, like just give them the thing they opted in for and like tell them a little bit about mm-hmm. what they're going to learn, get them excited. Um, but then after that thing kind of wears off, that's when you can go a little bit longer. It just more so has to do with people's expectations. Like if they mm-hmm. are waiting for something, there's no need to put them through a super long story. Just give them the thing. And that's a little bit of a shift that's going on, like you said, with people's attention spans. But um, yeah, you can go longer after that. You, you mentioned the deliverability. How, how can I improve the deliverability? Because it's really hard, I think nowadays, you know, especially if you're a company and then you're maybe you might end up in the spam folder or in the promotions tab or whatnot. Do you have any recommendations for this thing? Yeah. So the first thing would be to like understand if you have a problem, right? That's like the first step in anything. Mm-hmm. So all you have to do, um, and there's services like Clock Apps. I don't know if you've heard of that, but it's like this giant testing platform where they give you like 80 email addresses and you just download it and then you upload it to your ESP and then you just Mm -hmm. send an email to all 80 and it'll tell you like how you inbox for every single one of those. Um, They've got Google, um, they've got Yahoo, they've got Hotmail, they've got so many different platforms Um, and they have like new accounts, they have old accounts, they have personal accounts, they have business accounts. So you get like a, a really wide overview. Um, uh-huh. Or on a very simple level, which is what we recommend people to start with, is you just send a test email to yourself. Um, now, typically, you mm-hmm. want to send this to a new account that's not influenced by your previous opening habits. Um, but you just send it to like a new Gmail account. And you see, like, does it land in the primary inbox? Does it land in promotions? Does it land in spam? And that's how you figure out where you are. Um, so the next thing to do if you are having problems would be to make sure that your open rates, like today with iOS 15, I like to say you want to get a minimum 20% um, just to be safe. I used to say 15% or like even like 12 at the lowest, but now that open rates are a little more inflated since iOS 15, like you want to hit at least 20% minimum. Um, And that'll keep you super safe, right? Because if you're getting really low open rates, Google and Yahoo, they just pretty much look at you and they're like, well, I guess nobody wants to read these spam Um, and you're like really confused at that point. You don't know what to do. So you just want to make sure you get really high open rates. And if you're stuck um, and you start getting really high open rates, then Google and Yahoo and all those guys are like, okay, people want to read these again. So then they pull you out. Um, So that's the the basic level of what to do, just segmenting Mm -hmm. by engagement. Um, But on top of that, you can also use sites like mailgenius.com. 
and it'll tell mm-hmm. you like if you have any specific like spam triggers, like any specific words um, that might be putting you in the spam folder. Um, or let's say you've got something messed up on the technical side. So this is probably going to be way down the rabbit hole for a lot of people, but yeah, there's sure. like SPF, DKIM, DMARC, and like that site will tell you if you've got something wrong. Now, if you don't know how to fix that, I recommend you reach out to somebody like myself and we can take care of that for you. Mm-hmm. But um, those are some things that kind of commonly go wrong. Um, as far as avoiding the promotions folder, a lot of times it's not so much about the specific like keywords and phrases that you use, but it's more about like what percentage of the email is like deemed promotional. And if you just make the email longer and you use a lot of content that isn't promotional, well, you avoid the promotions tab. Um, and we have very specific, unique ways that we've done that too. But that's kind of like a 50,000 foot overview of different things you could try mm, if you're having Sure. Problems. That's cool. Thank you. That's very valuable. That's a problem of a lot of clients for of, of Digistore24 um, because it's kind of hard to get that open rate and to not be promotional, but to promote things at the same time, which everyone wants. So there is like this tension. Yeah, you, You're not supposed to use certain keywords. Otherwise, you're likely more likely to land in the spam folder. But at the same time, if you don't use certain keywords, people might be less interested because they opted in for a certain topic. So BizOp is about making money. And if you cannot say money <laughs> or dollars or what, all these words, it's kind of, you have to find like alternatives. There's a lot of people using these, um, you know, like these these variations of words, like, that they say dollars and they write the o, the o with a zero or something and or and the s with like a dollar sign or so. What do you think of those kinds of methods? Yeah, so we've actually found a way like to get around that where you don't have to. Like that's one of the exact problems that we solve, um, mm-hmm. especially when it comes to the promotions tab. So we're just really good at like knowing the exact keywords because we've been doing this so long that are triggering the promotions tab. But more importantly, like which words we can add to the email mm. that balance out those words. So you can use those words as long as you have some balance. And a lot of times we'll do mm-hmm. this in the form of like a little bio at the bottom, right? So mm-hmm. um, a little advanced, but we have like all the data on that. And there's really no need to like try and do that old school stuff where, you know, you're typing in a zero and seven O or anything. But mm. um At the end of the day, spam is a little bit more tricky. And again, much like human to human interaction, it's all about reputation. Um, Because if you go to Uh postmaster.google.com, Google will tell you what your reputation is. Like, do you have a really high reputation? Is it medium? Is it low? Or is it bad? And the higher it is, the more you can get away with that stuff anyway. Uh And you don't have to worry about going to spam. So a lot of it is like just long-term trust that you've built up with Google, Yahoo, Hotmail, et cetera. Um, but a lot of it too is just understanding that if you use promotional words, you can use them as long as you balance them out. Uh-huh. So once someone finds out that they don't have a good reputation anymore with those services, can they repair that? Is it possible to kind of get a different reputation over time? Yeah. Yeah. Now, um, different ways of doing it, right? But like a couple of questions ago, that one was mm. more or less like the path. So you just have to make sure you're sending to only like very engaged people. Um, mm-hmm. So like your best subscribers who always open, just send to only those people for like a week or two. And a lot of times that solves the problem. Uh, but mm. I do really recommend mail genius as well, because sometimes people are like stuck on a blacklist or something, and um, that'll help you identify that problem and help you get mm. off that blacklist. So there's, you know, there's probably like three to five main little culprits that can put somebody in spam. Mm-hmm. Um, but you just kind of have to find out which one it is. Uh, the main one is just historically low open rates. So you got to send to more engaged mm-hmm. people. And then there's blacklists, which are honestly kind of easy to get off of if you know what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And then just like balancing out a lot of those promotional keywords. I'd say those are like the top three things that people can do after they find out they have a problem. Uh -huh. Cool. Um, from your perspective, would, would you use the same approach for email marketing more or less if you were a big brand? Uh, just like you are like a small info product or coaching company would you do kind of the kind of the same strategy basically or would you do something differently yeah it's very similar um i mean we're working with a lot of the companies in joel marion syndicate right now um mm -hmm. and a lot of these are like very big like retail like grocery um and they used to kind of view it like they had to go the big commercial route because if you think about it like most people they approach email with like okay like i'm not quite sure what i'm doing so i'm just going to look at big companies and see what they yeah do. and a lot of times these companies they're just sending very like bland emails with coupons and like big pictures in them and everybody's used to that and people just zone that out so fast because they feel like they're a number rather than a person so a lot of times what we'll do is we'll take over the email list for one of these companies and we're like, hey, we're not going to put the company name. Like if you own company X, we're going to do Sven at company X. That's going to be the from name mm -hmm. because now it has a first name and they can relate to you because you're a person. There's no mm -hmm. longer like a faceless entity that's emailing them. It's a human. And they, mm -hmm. now we can tell stories. We can like get really creative. It's not just coupons and big pictures anymore. And people are kind of like at the beginning, they're like, what the heck? This is interesting. And then after a few emails, they're like, oh, okay. And then they, they start replying back to like the CEO of this company or whoever the face of the brand is and like telling mm -hmm. their stories. And then we can use that for more content. And it just kind of builds itself from there and just so much more trust and like good emotions that are being shared rather than just like coupon discount. I see. Picture. Would you use those templates? Those like, would you prefer, I mean, also like for a bigger brand, um, would you use like these, these non formatted, uh, plain text emails? Or would you rather say, okay, it's a brand, it's a nice brand, it has to be like, it has to look like more professional with a template and, and things like that? Yeah, we don't go like plain text on the emails. We do make them look very neat. So I wouldn't use mm -hmm. template in the sense of like where there's like a, a box to put the logo and then a picture, then the story starts and there's mm -hmm. like a nice um, like line around it. Um, a lot of times it's even simpler than that. We just make sure it looks neat. That, that's really mm -hmm. the main thing there because even if you put a logo at the top, a lot of times it, it still triggers that that thing in the back of people's heads where they're like, oh, I'm going to be sold something here. And then they click mm. off. Of it. So, um, yeah, it's just about looking really personal yet neat at the same time. I see. Okay. That's very cool. You, you mentioned like not too long ago, you mentioned social media and you mentioned that it helped you a lot. Um, can you, Can you tell me like how you approach social media and what your strategy is as to like your overall strategy? I mean, there's like a big part of email marketing, but there's also social media. How, go, how does that, how does that go together and how do you approach that? Yeah. Um, as far as social media, I pretty much just like use it. Like everybody starts on social media to connect with their friends, right? Um, and then as soon as you become a marketer <laughs> over the years, you realize that you have a lot of friends in the industry and you kind of like talk to them, but at the same time, it's your client acquisition. Um, and then all of a sudden, like random people will, will start finding you even on Facebook and following you. And like for me, I always check their um, profile and just see like if they're into copywriting, do they own a business, whatever. Um, does it look like they're going to vibe with what I'm putting out there? Um, and if it looks like they might, then I'll accept them. And then they start reading my stories. Um, so most of the time, mm. you know, like I was saying, personal, more private stories, like longer ones, those are safe for the email list because I want my subscribers to feel more special, right? Like they subscribe. So I'm going to reward them with like better content, but on social, okay. it's just more so like combining like marketing tips and like 
fun stories and like actual lessons and like how I discovered that tip in a weird way, rather than just like, here's a tip. Like I've seen some Mm. people that are like, Hey, here's how to make a better subject line. And they'll like give a couple examples and it's kind of boring. But if Mm. you tell a really weird story about the time that you accidentally hit send and your client was angry at you, but then all of a sudden the, the subject line that they hated actually won. And like at the end, like, they got over mm-hmm. it and it, like this crazy story, it's just way more entertaining that way. Mm-hmm. Um, we'll tell some of those. Uh, or well, I still write all my posts, so I'll tell some of those. Um, at the same time, I'll just make like regular posts that people are used to. Um, like yesterday, I posted a picture of me and Charlie Sheen because he was at the 100 million event. And strangely in this photo, him and I, like he looks like he could be my dad. Like, Mm -hmm. it's crazy how similar we look. And I made a caption. It was like, twins by day, but definitely not by night. And it's just, like, funny. Um, So weird things like that where people are going to, like, laugh at it and just, like, do what social media is intended for. Um, And we combine, like, interesting marketing content with just, like, regular social media content. And then every so often, I'll have a pitch. But... A lot of times people will just reach out anyway. I'll be like, hey, like I've been reading your post. I really like the one where you talked about this. Um, and people will pick out very specific stories and they'll remember that because they watched it. And then all of a sudden you get a message about it. And especially if you're starting out, it might seem like that it'll take a really long time to get to that point. Um, but a lot of people give up too early. It's like if you keep posting, you don't know, but there's people talking about you and there's people mm. that are thinking about messaging you and they're so close. And then you finally post that one story that just hits home with them and they message you. So it takes a little bit of time, but you just have to stick with it and use that strategy um, and just be really interesting because at the end of the day, people just want entertainment. Like even in B2B settings or like very serious business people, we're all still humans on the inside. We just want to be entertained and like read cool things that we're interested in. Cool. Thank you. Um, What kind of lifestyle do you live? Like you travel a lot, as we talked about uh, in in the beginning of our conversation. Uh, How does your average day, what does it look like? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I'm on right now. I'm on a six week trip. Um, okay, <laughs> going to a lot of different events and having some fun and just traveling. Um, and with my girlfriend Julia, we've been together a year, so we went to like Hawaii in the middle of all these other events going on. So it's been super fun. Um, I mean, growing up, I'm from Indiana, and um, I, I didn't know this growing up, but like now that I go back, like Indiana, like compared to Florida. There was like mm-hmm. a massive difference in like the quality of life. So like growing up, I just mm-hmm. wanted to like play baseball and like live a normal house. And my parents wanted me to get a good job. And like everybody like either has a decent corporate job or they work in a factory or in a farm. Sometimes there's like pickup trucks in people's front yards. But mm-hmm. um, so then when I got to Florida and started making a little bit, it was like, wow, it's like, okay. I had to get over this mental block that was telling me that it like wasn't okay to, to like have nice things or to like go live in a nicer house or whatever. So, um, since making a little more, it's like, you know, upgraded the place I live, upgraded my car, got like a watch and stuff. But after about a year or two, I'm not one of those people that like threw it all out the window and like went Alex Becker and like minimalist, but ah. I've kind of realized that at this point I really just enjoy like building, building, building and I take yeah. everything extra and I'll go put it in like other companies and like Joel and Dan syndicate um, and like go help build those companies with email because that's my expertise and it's fun. So I like to travel. I like a touch of nice things, but ultimately when you have it, for a certain amount of time, you're just like, uh, I just want to keep building and, and having fun and just, um, Mm -hmm. really scaling. And it it takes time too, because I remember the first time that my, my tax person told me that to save on taxes, I was going to have to take like 13 grand that year 
and put it into a SEP account that I'm not allowed to touch until I mm. retire. And I was at that moment, I was like, so sad. I was like, you're telling me I can't spend this for only God knows how many years. And I was like very angry. Mm -hmm. But then now I look at that and I'm putting in like way more and like money that I'm not going to see for years and years and years. And it's just like, I'm okay with it because you hit a certain mm -hmm. point and like, you just, I mean, it's different for everybody, but you just, you realize that it's not everything. You just want to keep building and growing and just like, enjoying the journey and having fun, but still having enough left for yourself where you're not stressed and you can travel and you can spoil yourself once in a while. Hmm. Yeah, I like this healthy mixer that you described. I think Alex Becker is a little bit extreme, like empty house, nothing. And not <laughs> he, he did a video with a tour and literally nothing. <laughs> I think that's that's quite extreme, but but it's also interesting because that it makes him special and it it kind of also sells his persona, so that's kind of cool. And the other extreme is a guy like Grant Cardone, but he 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 says that he kind of needs it for his marketing. Look look at the, the jet and 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 whatnot and the well, helicopter. The jet, and... You can actually you can get a massive tax write off for buying a jet. Like, mm. this is something <laughs> that I didn't even know until recently, but like at 100 Million Mastermind, there's like probably four or five people now at least who have bought jets and you get to defer that tax payment. I don't know how long because I'm nowhere close to buying a jet, but mm. uh, there's a lot of different crazy things you can do with jets and real estate um, and a few other things. Now, not financial advice, of course, but um, yeah, there's sure. a lot of people doing it. <laughs> Cool. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, that was a great conversation. So as kind of like a last question, do you have a book that you can recommend that you really like that helped you? Hmm. A book that I really like. There's a, I like pitch anything by Warren Claff. It just makes you really mm -hmm. confident to, to sell um, and be like, be really rock solid confident that what you have can help other people. Like that's really fun. Um, yeah, I would say that's, that's one of my favorites, but, uh, I've got a little shelf at home. I'm, I'm not a crazy reader by mm -hmm. any means, but there's a few books out there that I like, and that's, that's one of them. Cool. If people want to get in touch with you or use your service or learn more about you or your service, uh, how can they do that the best? Yeah. So, um, email paramedic.com. It's my deliverability service. Mm -hmm. um, outside of that, just messaging me on Facebook, Troy Erickson, or uh, mm -hmm. Troy at leadparamedic.com. Um, yeah, just having a conversation first. All right. Thank you, Troy. I really enjoyed this conversation. It was amazing. And I'm looking forward to the next one. Yeah, thank you so much, Dan. I appreciate it. Thank you. If you enjoyed this episode, hit the subscribe button and never miss an episode of Svencast again.